Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 28 this morning. I know a man. I met him when I was in my 20s. He's a preacher. At that time, he was teaching at a very prestigious seminary. And he came to our church and preached a revival. And I was a young ministerial student. And he was kind enough to give me some helpful pointers on serving God. Later, he became pastor of a very large and very prestigious, well-known church. And I met him again. And he was pleased to see how far I'd come. And he gave me some more helpful pointers. I was very flattered by his attention. When it, within a year of that meeting, he fell into sin. He had to resign his position. And I don't know where he is today. Now, in my opinion, he wasn't just some phony charlatan. He wasn't some money-grubbing hypocrite. I had a lot of respect for him. I still have a lot of respect for him. But what are we to make of such men? Let's take a look. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning with verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek and not the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced, by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath. When God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Let's pray. Father, may your spirit speak through your word today. Help us to have a more firm <coughs> commitment and reliance to our hope in Jesus because of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that was a large chunk of Scripture to begin with. But basically, it's very simple. Levi's priesthood was flawed. The Messiah is not of Levi. And the Messiah supersedes Levi's priesthood. That's what that all says in that passage there. But let's kind of break that down a little bit. The argument is twofold. One, the Levitical priesthood is flawed. It's unable to produce human perfection. Even though it offers sacrifices over and over all the time, and the great annual sacrifice for the sins of all the people, it doesn't ever change us. It just sort of ensures us. We used to say when I was a, a, in college about someone that uh, made a decision for Christ but they weren't really doing anything. We used to say all they had was fire insurance. Now, they're not going to hell, but they're not doing much to go to heaven either. So the first argument is that the Levitical priesthood is flawed. The second argument in that passage is Christ's priesthood Melchizedek priesthood, is not just something that the Christians made up. It's not a fabrication that they made up to try to explain things away, but that in fact 
it's established in Psalm 10, uh, 110, verse 4. So the answer is also, that's the argument, the answer is, since the Levitical priesthood could not bring perfection, a greater priesthood is needed. That's Jesus. He is a priest not from the tribe of Levi, not from the law that Moses established, not made up later on by the Christians, but prophesied in the Old Testament. And Christ's greater priesthood is necessary, pardon me, Christ's greater priesthood of necessity causes a change in the Jewish system. Because the law couldn't contain that. And Jesus said something along those lines when he said, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. Because if you pour new wine into an already used old wineskin, the new wine is going to be all effervescent and fermenting inside, and it's going to rip apart that old leather bag because it's it's old, it's been used, it's now stiff, and it can't contain that new thing. Well, the old law, the old way of doing things, can't contain all of the power of the real messianic life that Jesus brings. And so it has to, of necessity, supersede it. It doesn't destroy it. It just is beyond it. And he makes a point to point out that Jesus can't be a priest according to the old system. He's of the tribe of Levi. He's not of the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's wonderful. But he still can't be a Levitical priest. He never could have served in the Levitical order. And his priesthood is not based on human ancestry. It's based on an oath from God. I, I have sworn that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's based on, I like how he put it there in Hebrews. What is that verse, the phrase that he uses? Uh, there it is, verse 16. It, it appears, pardon me, verse 15 says, what we've said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, verse 16, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as of his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. That doesn't mean Superman. That means he has lived forever. He died and he conquered death. He rose from the dead and now he lives forever. He has an indestructible life and he serves as a priest, what does the psalm say? Forever. He doesn't ever quit. He's never not our great high priest anymore. He is eternally our great high priest. And that's something that you look at and you go, yeah, hold on, I'll file that under religious stuff. But when a Jewish person sees that, and especially a Jewish person 2,000 years ago living in that old system, that was very powerful to say. For two reasons. Number one, the high priest represented all of Israel. The high priest represented God to Israel and Israel to God. And that was a very wonderful and powerful thing. And number two, they despised their high priest because they were appointed by the Romans. And so they lived in a skewed system that they adored and loved and hated at the same time. And for this passage to come along and say, Jesus is now your eternal high priest. That was powerful. That was, he's not appointed by him. Matter of fact, the Romans killed him. And he conquered that. And now he stands forever saying, thank you very much, Romans. I'm the high priest. What are you going to do about it now? That's Don's interpretation. <laughs> So the Messiah supersedes the Levitical priesthood. Aaron and the Levites were designated priests because of the authority of God at Sinai. Jesus has an eternal priesthood based on an oath that is the solid promise of God in eternity. That's power. Because he is indestructible. He lives forever. Look at verse 23. Now, there have been many priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent 
priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Human mortality prevents even the greatest priest from staying on in office. So let me give you two examples that I hope you'll grasp right away. Number one, in the Old Testament, you have Samuel. Before there was a king in Israel, Samuel was almost the benevolent dictator of Israel. They went to him. They looked to him. They, they sought him out when they wanted to know God's will. They made decisions based on what Samuel said God was saying to them. And when Samuel passed away, it was the end of an era. And even Saul, corrupt as he was, felt that loss. Let me give you another one. Billy Graham. He hasn't done much in the last ten years, but you still know that meaning. Billy Graham has been a name and a force in America since 1948, I think it was, when he preached in, in Los Angeles at the... Uh, um, was that at the Coliseum? Uh, at Youth for Christ event. And he burst onto the American stage because of one thing. A radio announcer in Los Angeles got dragged to that crusade to cover it and turned his life to Jesus and went back and got on his radio and told everybody what Billy Graham had done. And Billy Graham has been the confidant of presidents since Eisenhower, I think. He's been a conscience for America, and now he's fading. You don't hear much from him anymore. When he passes away, in my opinion, it's going to be like the passing of Sandra. The greatest leader passes. We're mortal. It's wonderful. You look back at, at how powerful and the, the able to go before presidents and say, he did it to Nixon. You're wrong. He did it to other presidents. You shouldn't be doing this. It's wrong. Nobody like that today. There's nobody in that position today. And that's wonderful and it's great. And you look back and you go, oh, to have a person like that. But we don't. The greatest are mortal. And so the Levitical priesthood had to continually be passed on to others of less experience. Now I have people, Christians today ask me, are the Jews waiting to rebuild the temple? Well, if you talk to a Reformed Jew, no. <laughs> if you talk to an Orthodox Jew, oh, that God would change things so that could be possible. But every Orthodox Jew in the world knows that for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem means nuclear war in the Middle East. There's no possible way to rebuild the temple on Temple Mount without getting rid of the Islamic Dome of the Rock mosque. And even if, I've heard some people say, maybe there'll be an earthquake and knock it down, do you think any Islamic person would be would care a whit They'd rather have that thing sitting there in a pile of rubble than have any Jew stand in that spot. There is no way in this world, at this time, for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem without a war, and probably a nuclear war. Number two, there's a little problem of not knowing who is a descendant of Levi. Now, there's talk about DNA stuff, but I have this problem on that. Uh, I don't think we have any of Levi's DNA, to the best of my knowledge. I mean, maybe there are smarter people than me on that. Maybe they can figure out how to do it. I don't know. But the fact is, the Jews themselves have a problem with it. And if you go back and read the post-exilic prophets, the minor prophets, they had a problem with it after coming out of Babylon. There were people came in, coming and saying, I'm a priest. Uh, wait a minute. What are your credentials? you got to prove it. Even then, when it was only 70-something years, there were people coming along saying, me, me, wait a minute, we don't know. 
And what do you do now after 2,000 years? And so there's a problem. How do you establish who is in the proper priestly authority? But the point here is, the Levitical priesthood, even in its prime, was always having to be passed continually from those of great experience to those of lesser experience. When I became a pastor, let me let me implement that. I was called to the ministry in 1972. I did not become a paid pastor of a congregation until 1984. And in 1984, when I became a pastor, I was young and fresh and cutting edge. And it, the, it was the transition of the pastors who came out here from the South in the 40s and 50s to us young bucks who grew up in California. And we were cool and we knew the cults of Californians. Now I'm old. And I don't understand anything anymore. It doesn't make any sense to me. I got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, but in fact, it's passing on to younger ministers that are coming and being called. And that's just the way of life. That's the way it goes. In the pastoral ministry as well as in the Levitical priesthood. But Jesus is different. Because he's immortal, because the resurrected Jesus has conquered death, his priesthood is both eternal and therefore perfect. It's never going to pass away, and he's never going to get old and fuddy. And because of that, he can offer an eternal salvation based on his eternal priesthood. It's possible. He can do something that no other Levitical priest was ever able to do. You and I need work breaks. We need real breaks. We need frequent vacations. Jesus doesn't need to take a day off. He's always before the Father, arguing for you. When you did that thing, you know what I'm talking about. And the devil comes running to God. God, God, did you see what they did? Jesus is right there saying, I died for that. He's always interceding for you, always covering you, always blessing you. That's so wonderful. Verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, Unlike other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. I'm hoping you're seeing, as we've gone through these seven chapters of Hebrews, the building of his argument here. His argument from the very beginning has been, who is Jesus? From the beginning, he said, he's above the angels. He's above Moses. He's above the law because he is God. He's not sort of God. He's not kind of God. When we say son of God, we don't mean less than God. We mean God. And we're not talking about three gods standing together going, Hi, we're God. We're talking about one God who has re represented himself to us as Father, Son, and Spirit. How did he do that? Do you think I know? There's all kinds of pictures of how, but how is a Roman question? You know what I'm talking about? You tell a Roman, I've got a car, bought a new car. And the Roman says, how does it work? That's what the Romans wanted to know. Your Greek friend, he says, what does it look like? Because the Greeks, right, they're interested in form and beauty. But the Romans, they want to know how things work. You tell your Hebrew friend, I got a new car. He says, what does it do? 
When you go to the Bible, you don't ask Roman questions. How did God do that? You don't ask Greek questions. What did Jesus look like? You ask Hebrew questions. What's the point? What does it do? Why, why are you telling me this? What does this mean to me? Those are Hebrew questions. And the Hebrew question is not how is God three in one. The Hebrew question is what does that mean to me? That means that God the Father can send God the Son and God the Spirit can dwell inside you. How? Ah, Roman question. So, because Jesus is the perfect high priest, he's what a high priest ought to be. He's holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to sit around in the heavens polishing his halo because he uses that perfection to meet our needs. Even as he's sitting on the throne, on the right hand of the Father, he's not sitting there going, look at me. He's sitting there serving you. What did he, what did he say? Son of man came not, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And he's still doing that, representing you before the Father. That is what a high priest ought to be. And that's who he is and what he does. He's unhampered by sin. You know, most people expect their pastors to be that, homely and blameless and set apart from sinners. I got news for you. That's true of Jesus. Human priests, human pastors, if you don't like the word priest, spend much of their own time just getting themselves right before God so they can help you. Because I'm just like you. God didn't look at me and go, wow, that John, he's so wonderful. I need to make him a minister. Matter of fact, is what I told somebody yesterday. God takes the bad little boys and makes them preachers. This guy needs help. I'm going to make him a preacher. <laughs> he's superior to Levi, is what that means. His whole ministry is superior to Levi. Not that the Levitical priesthood was a bad thing. It is simply inadequate. to be. It's like Paul said. The law came along. The law didn't save anybody. It didn't fix anybody. All it did was make me look at myself and go, Ah! I can't do this! Every time I look, at, even if I just only look at the Ten Commandments and ignore the other 604, or whatever, if you like 18, you can go that one. But... Even if I only look at the Ten Commandments, I look at those and I go, okay, well, I didn't murder anybody this, this week. Oh, but I coveted. <sighs> Man. Oh, and I told my dad to take a hike. And uh, and I went golfing on Sunday. I look at the law and I say, as hard as I try, God, this week I did okay on number four, but number seven, mm, that's that one up. Oh, you know what, God? I didn't break a single command. Oh, I was in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> the law shows us that we need a Savior. That's the whole purpose of the law. God, help, I can't do this. And Christ's priesthood does what the Levitical priesthood couldn't do. And the reason the Levitical priesthood couldn't do it was because it's based on the law, and therefore even the priest couldn't live up to it. But the Melchizedek priesthood of the Son of God is perfect and eternal. And so I charge you, turn to Christ. He's the only one that can save you. You're, the Baptist church isn't going to save you. Christianity isn't going to save you. Jesus is the only one. Which brings us back to my failed friend. I don't know what he is, where he is, but I would dearly love the opportunity to minister to him as he did to me. Because I think all Christians fail. He just did it on a big stage in a big way. I don't think he was a charlatan or a hypocrite. I think he was human. All too often, 
good people fail miserably. And there's an old saying that the Christian army is the only army that shoots its wounded. When someone blows it big time in the church, we tend to trash them and throw them away. And that's sad. I'm not making an excuse for his failure, but I am telling you, his failure is the reason Jesus died on the cross. Let's pray. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Help us, Lord, to recognize our own failings before you and to have grace for the failings of others. Lord, be glorified in our lives and in the life of this body and help us to celebrate our eternal salvation through our eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. Amen.